I wanted to welcome today's guest speaker, Tracy. If you were uh, able to attend the 2023 Wisconsin Respite Summit, you were able to hear Tracy speak, but she is going to talk today about a uh, sort of a similar topic, but she's going to get more in depth. Tracy's going to discuss how communities can focus on diversity, equity, and cultur culturally responsive care. Um, Tracy did go through RCAW's Bringing Respite to Your Community. Um, what else can I say? Tracy brings over 20 years of combined expertise in business, social and community services, special education, and working with juvenile delinquency and at-risk youth. So what's going to happen is I'm going to go first and then give you a high-level overview of RCAW's programs, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. Um, people can absolutely, as I'm speaking, they can ask questions. Um, my colleague Leslie is also here, so she's going to be moderating the chat. So please feel free um, to also type questions in the chat. What else? Um, I'll leave everyone um, my email in the chat. You can also find it on our website. And also on our website, um, I am going to be posting the slide deck, so my PowerPoint presentation. And then Tracy, I believe we communicated with that. Um, am I able to, sh to share your PowerPoint on our website with the individuals? Absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so um, I would say by the end of the week, I usually have it by the end of the day, but I don't like to over promise and under deliver. <laughs> so most likely by the end of the day, but I, I like to cover myself definitely by the end of the week. Um, I'll have my PowerPoint, Tracy's PowerPoint, in the recording to today's webinar on our website um, underneath the Webinar Wednesday um, link. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Just going to get my presentation open, which I thought I had. Here we go. Right. So I know I recognize some names. So for some people, this might be a refresher of our information. I do have some updated things to talk about. So this might be uh, some new information for some individuals. So welcome. Um, Respite Care Association of Wisconsin. We do serve all 72 counties and 11 tribes across the state. And we promote, support, and expand quality statewide respite care across the lifespan. Um, I am absolutely going to um, strongly assume that individuals on the call do know what respite care is. But I do want to point out that professionals on the call, um, when you're working with family caregivers, don't assume that they know what respite care is. Because a lot of times as we're working with individuals, they might not know that respite care is a short break for them. Um, from their primary caregiving duties. So always try and take a step back. And when you say respite care, don't, don't assume that they know what that is. Uh, this can be a great slide. Um, we have it as a separate flyer, which I'll get into in a little bit um, of the benefits of respite care. Oftentimes individuals can be, you know, once they know what respite care is, they can be, um, they can be a little reluctant to receive it or to find it. Um, so we have some great marketing materials that we can send you for free to give to your customers, clients. There's a lot of names that, that we use for people that we work with, um, and we're happy to send you those, and I can show you where to find them in just a bit. We do have free training opportunities for individuals. Um, you did hear me say a little bit ago that Tracy did go through the Bringing Respite to Your Community workshop, which I'll talk about. We also have the respite care provider training. We have the kit for caregivers, that's for family caregivers, knowledge, ideas, and tools, and the kit for respite care providers and some specialized training. So the respite care provider training, essentially what it is, it's like I said, it's free. Um, it's online 
learners can work at their own pace. There are 10, uh, 10 courses. Uh, essentially, um, once you complete those, there is a pretest and a post test. And that is just to, to guide, engage how much people are, how much people know before they take the course and how much they learn once they're done with the course. Individuals, when they complete it, they have the option to join the, um, to be then create a profile, I should say, and be listed on the Wisconsin Respite Care Registry. Um, also, it's it's really great that we do have the Respite Care Provider Training in Spanish. Bringing respite to your community. This is, and, and you can get, um, I, I feel like when we do these webinars and we do this high level stuff, it's kind of like information overload. Once again, more information on these courses is available on our website. And I'm also happy to answer as many questions as needed in the chat or after the webinar. Um, so bringing respite to your community. This is a six week course. This is, um, you know, people that, there's such a lack of providers across the state, across the nation, who want to or who provide respite care, and anyone that wants to start their own business or their own agency, that can be a really overwhelming and daunting experience. So this is a six-week course that is led by Val Madsen, our incredible colleague. Um, she's won national awards for her trainings that she. Um, she designs and she meets virtually. And there's also some coursework that would be self-led on your own. And um, it's how to, you know, design programs, how to market, program development, staffing, licensing if needed, and more. And there's been some really great programs that's been started across the state because of this. The kit for caregivers that we have. So a lot of times we were talking about earlier that you know we don't want to solely assume that caregivers first of all know what know what respite care is, right? So we want to, and then taking even a step back further, a lot of times family caregivers don't identify as family caregivers. They think I'm a wife caring for my loved one, or I'm a child caring for my mother, or I'm a mother caring for my my sibling, or I'm a, even more of an underserved population. I'm a grandparent caring for my grandchild. So it's helping individuals identify as caregivers, then educating them on what respite care is, the short break from their you know primary duties. Then um, once they you help them identify let them know what respite care is, it's really overwhelming. Everything is overwhelming for them. And then they realize they do need a break. That's overwhelming in itself. So what we did was created this kit for caregivers and it's how to hire, train and retain respite care providers. Uh, when I say course, that in, in itself can be overwhelming. So individuals are more than welcome to go through the course. However, um, to be less overwhelming for them, you can also go to that web page and there's like seven, seven or eight, no, there's seven PDF downloads um, that you can click and grab and print um, and just kind of grab and go, if you will, for a lack of better terms on interview questions, how to run a background check. And it's essentially... Um, the meat and potatoes, if you will. Sorry, I couldn't think of a better a better term, but it's it's the bulk of what's in the course. Some individuals have time and you know might get more by you know taking that actual online course. Some they just want to grab and they want to go. Um, we also have the kit for the respite care providers. Um, the why behind that course. So we talked about earlier, and we all know, and we all feel the. Uh, the lack of providers across the state. And we had individuals after taking the respite care provider training and being listed on the registry saying, okay, I took the course, I'm on the registry, now what? I'm not getting clients. And that was like, oh my gosh, because there's such a need for providers. So Vale, who I talked about earlier, who is our uh, training and development specialist, 
she created how to market yourself as a respite care provider, which has proved to be very beneficial for individuals, and also how to become an independent respite care provider, right? So if you don't, if individuals are choosing not to work for an agency and they want to work for themselves, um, how to do that because all of this can be overwhelming for the provider. We also have some specialized training. If um, anyone on webinar Wednesday today is working with um, adults, older adults living with dementia or some type of memory impairment, we do have an online partnership um, with the Community Development and Engagement Training with the University UW Oshkosh, and um, we do have the promo code for the Dementia Generalist for Friends and Family or Dementia Generalist for Healthcare Providers. Typically, we do um, we only give the promo code to those who have taken the respite care provider training. However, if someone does come and you know comes to a webinar Wednesday and has interest, we do want as many people working with older adults. Um, living, working with older adults, living with some kind of uh, memory impairment to get that training, feel free to reach out to me and we can absolutely give you that promo code and we cover that cost for you. There also is a direct course curriculum available on our website and there's a form you can fill out and there's 45 different courses and we cover the cost. There's many different topics, um, not, not just dementia related. Go check it out. And if something interests you, please reach out. We do offer online and in-person training. Um, and there's the list right there. Um, other topics as requested. We are a small, a small team. Um, so we we try to do as much in person as we can, and there is a form online that individuals can fill out and it comes to us and we contact you and we work with you to the best of our abilities and online is um, also available. We can do trainings by Zoom. There's Caring for Challenging Moments that's um, led by Val that's more geared more towards um, children. I lead managing behaviors that challenge us. Um, geared towards adults and older adults with dementia and how to hire, train, and retain respite care providers. We can work with family caregivers in that realm and other topics. I also want to just let everyone know about our, our, our uh, YouTube channel. Lots of different topics um, from past trainings that we've done. Check it out. The link is on our website. The respite care the Wisconsin Respite Care Registry. This essentially is a bridge to connect people who provide respite care to those who need respite care. Essentially what a family caregiver can do or a respite care provider. Um, so if you need respite care, you can do a search of what county you live in, the age of the care recipient and the type of respite care, meaning are you looking for a provider to come into your home or facility-based? And then on the right-hand side of the screen, become a respite care provider. That would be if you went through the respite care provider training. I do want to point out that we do have certain, um, there are some agencies listed on the registry. Um, those are individuals who, or not individuals, excuse me. Those are agencies who have filled out the form and indicated they are available. They have room in their caseload. Um, to provide respite care. We do have registry compliance. See, we're not the employers of indiv individuals listed on the registry. It's a consumer-based platform, but we do have registry compliance where every 60 days they get an email indicating that they need to respond to the email, go into their profile, ensure they still have availability, all of their contact information is up to date. And if they don't respond to that, they get another email. And within five days, if they haven't indicated that everything is up to date and current and appropriate, we remove them from the registry. This is a sample profile of what you'll see. You get their full name, email, how to get a hold of them, their phone, counties they can work in, 
ages, hours available, education, certifications, and any other trainings that they have completed. It's up to the person hiring them. This is definitely a frequently asked question. It's up to the person hiring them to run the background check, do the interview, and make an informed decision if it's a good fit for their family. We also have an option called respite connections. If a family caregiver has a need for an in-home care provider, they can go to our website and fill out a form. I want to go to the next. Uh, okay, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that those next two slides were there and they are. Um, so you can fill out the age of the care recipient, the needs, the hours that you need, the location, the payment sources, meaning is it private pay? Is it CLTS? Is it whatever the payment source is? Then it comes to us, we review it for appropriateness, and then it gets posted into under the Respite Connections portal. And those in the county that provide respite care can then view and hopefully make a good match. So this is what it would look like to create a post. And then this is what um, this is what individuals would see. Uh, so there's no last name. There's no private health information that's that's getting. Um, we're really careful about you know privacy and private health information. And then there have been some successful um, connections being made to individuals who do need some in-home care for their loved one. Okay, so let's talk about our grant programs. First, let's talk about some interesting data. <laughs> Sorry, I think I skipped a slide. So I love data. Data makes the world go round in our in our nonprofit. But I do want to point out that when you're work, if you're a professional and you're working with caregivers, caregivers who receive four or more hours of respite care per week had a decrease in self-reported burden over time, while the comparison of caregivers experienced an increase in self-reported burden. So what I'm, my, my whole point in, create, in including this data, four hours of respite care per week is not a lot. And we can help with those, with the grant programs I'm about to tell you about. And a lot of times when we're working with caregivers and they're, you know, doing surveys after they get some respite care, or we're working with them and communicating in emails and over the phones. They're not going on lavish vacations or doing incredible like spa days, which we wish they could. Like they're using this respite care to go grocery shopping by themselves or to take a nap or to do um, things that are just everyday things for them. So just four hours a week. Also, I love this piece of data. Feel free to share it. You can see on the left, um, a few slides, or one of the first slides that I shared was respite care can decrease institutional placement, meaning a nursing home or an assisted living. You can see on the left, the average cost of nursing home placement is $111,000 a year. Annual cost of 10 hours of weekly respite care is 11,000 a year. It's a lot of leftover money. All right, so let's get into it. Caregiver Respite Grant Program. The thing that we love about this is essentially most people are eligible. This is not income-based. We um, So, okay, I'll get in. Sorry, I get so excited about this grant. I never even know like where to start. So it, um, it can help people provide up to five days of respite care within 30 days of approval. The best part is this breaks down a ton of barriers. Um, it, we don't at RCAW have no preference on who the applicant hires. You can hire, right? Because sometimes that's a barrier. People, um, people meaning family caregivers, they might not be trusting of a respite care provider they don't know. So they can hire a friend, a family member, a neighbor. You can absolutely hire someone from an agency or off of our registry or um, we have offset the cost of people who need an assisted living placement or a skilled nursing placement. Um, 
And I do just want to show the need for this grant program when it was, uh, when we started it in the, our 2018, 2019 grant year, what we spent, and you can see it went up and up and up and up and how much money that we've allocated across the entire state for this grant. Now, I'm also going to show you the eligibility criteria, but first, let me show you how to apply. So the family or the primary caregiver would complete the eligibility criteria form online. That's on our website. Then we would need the ADRC or the county to submit the supporting documentation form. That's a fillable form online. It usually takes under three minutes. Once our CAW, once we receive those forms, um, we send the application link to the applicant's email. They would fill it out and then we, re we review it um, for appropriateness. Um, sometimes um, we have a few questions, like if, if the applicant, it, it doesn't pay for retroactive dates, it needs to be in the future. It does need to be within the next 30 days. And then uh, typically if everything's filled out correctly, we can approve it. Typically it's a pretty quick turnaround. Now I'm going to talk about the supplemental respite grant program, then I'll get into the eligibility criteria because the application process for these two grants are very, very similar. It's just the allowable expenses um, are different. So this grant helps, helps cover the cost for housekeeping, meal prep, laundry, lawn care, snow removal, transportation, and technology. Same application process with the eligibility criteria form. Um, it is, you would go to the Supplemental Respite Grant Program page for the eligibility criteria, um, the supporting documentation form. It's the same form, um, the Aging and Disability Resource Center or the county, depending on the age of the care recipient, would click, would indicate which grant they're applying for. You can apply for both at the same time currently. Um, so they would either indicate the caregiver respite grant program, supplemental respite grant program, or both. Um, and also, we have no preference on who you hire. Um, we have some applicants who hire a neighbor to come and cut their grass. Um, we have some who hire a company. Um, I would definitely say that housekeeping uh, and lawn care and snow removal are, are our most um, are most requested for this grant. So here is the eligibility criteria for both of um, the grants for family caregivers. So the caregiver respite grant and the supplemental. Uh, so if they've applied for a long-term care waiver, do I have a list of those? I thought I did. So when we say long-term care waivers, we mean or long-term care. Um, support programs or other programs for family caregivers. We mean the National Family Caregiver Support Program, the uh, Alzheimer's Family Caregiver Support Program. Um, it could be a managed care organization, could be IRIS. Um, we also can help kinship care, adoptive, foster. Oh my goodness, I know I'm missing them without a list in front of me. Um, CLTS, so Children's Long-Term Support, we do serve the lifespan. So if they've applied for any of the programs, and there is a list on our website, and they're not expecting to receive services or, or approval within 30 days, or if they've been waitlisted, um, if they've been denied any of those programs, sometimes because of a functional screen, individuals get denied. Um, if they've been approved, but they've exhausted their funds from the program, that typically um, occurs with the National Family Caregiver Support Program, the NFCSP or the AFCSP, the Alzheimer's Family Caregiver Support Program. If they've applied and they're receiving other supports and the applicant needs the flexibility not covered by current funding supports, that's typically individuals receiving um, CLTS, the Children's Long-Term Support Programs um, in their counties, and they're not able in that county to get coverage for housekeeping, lawn care, snow removal, or if they've not applied for long-term care waiver supports because they're ineligible. 
um, but we still would need that supporting documentation from the ADRC or the county. This is just showing the growth, just checking my, my time. I wanna make sure I leave enough time for Tracy. Ways for grants for family caregivers to break down barriers. They can hire a friend or family. They can use an agency. They can use a facility. The group respite grant. Um, this is they have two more slides, Tracy, and then I'll turn it over to you. So the group respite grant provides funding. So agencies, um, they, they can, so essentially what, what it is, is if an agency or an organization is holding an event for four family caregivers, like recreation, education, uh, anything that would benefit a family caregiver, a lot of times the barrier is they can't attend because they don't have respite care. So if they can provide respite care on site um, and family caregivers can attend, that is something the group respite grant program can cover funding for. The startup grant, uh, this is a newer grant um, thanks to a federal grant that we received. And also we have separate funding from Milwaukee County um, because of Bader Philanthropies. Um, the amount you can request is five to $25,000. Uh, a prerequisite is someone does have to go through the Bringing Respite to Your Community workshop. More info on our website. Okay, that is what I had to go over. And I am going to turn it over to Tracy. Hello, everyone. Just bear with me. Let me get my PowerPoint up. No worries. Okay, um, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us um, today and allowing me to uh, speak with you all today. So I've been asked to uh, talk about diversity, equity, and culturally responsive care. I'm speaking um, actually on this topic um, from the heart, but also as a business, uh, business owner and just challenges and things that I face as a business owner. And so what I'm asking for everybody today is just to bear with me. My presentation is probably totally different than any presentation you ever uh, saw because I like to present things where we go back to the origins. Where, why is this happening in our society today? How can we um, turn it around? What is some of the steps that has already been taken so we're not repeating steps? And then where do we go as a whole from there? So again, um, just bear with me. We're going to go through this together. Um, there is some sensitive things on this presentation. Um, you all in the field probably is used to it uh, and being just seeing these things and understanding, but there might be some people on here that um, has never heard of some of the terms or uh, has never uh, saw some of the clips, uh, well, the pictures, so just bear with me. This is a safe place for all. This is a learning environment. Um, and we're just here to come together to get a better understanding of uh, diversity, equity, and being culturally responsive with the care we do. Um, I would like to, first of all, uh, thank the staff of the RCAW for allowing me to be a guest speaker. Um, and thank you guys for your hard work and dedication for putting these free uh, webinars together and workshops together for us. Um, anyone that is in this uh, field knows that this is very beneficial. Um, and then the fact that we can all do it from Zoom even makes it more uh, better for us all. So from here, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to jump into the um, presentation. Uh, we're going to take it one step at a time. We'll hold questions um, to the end, if you all don't mind, just so I can kind of expand and talk about why I presented what I presented in each slide. 
to give you a better understanding. All right. All right, so here we go. Back down memory lane, why is history so important in today's society? Um, the reason why history is important in today's society is because it allows us to um, have an understanding of how events in the past um, has made things the way they are today. It allows us uh, as individuals, it doesn't matter of your, your color, your background, your sexual preference, but it allows us to learn ourselves um, as individuals in a manner where we can be accountable for our actions um, against other people or towards other people based off whatever our disbeliefs or upbringings might be. It allows us to develop the ability to avoid mistakes, maybe mistakes that we did in the past. I know I've did a lot of mistakes um, and create better paths for our society. Um, as human service field workers, we're here to um, have better outcomes. So these are just some of the things that we can do as individuals in our own capacity. Being able to analyze and explain the problems in the past um, and which positions or pathways that we can take for a better future for our next generation. And then just being able to provide crucial perspective and understanding and solving current and future problems. So that is what we're going to do. And we're gonna start off going back into our history until we get to, to current today. All right, so understanding the history of slavery and the origin of systemic racism. In the 17th and 18th centuries, people were kidnapped from the continent of Africa and forced into slavery in the American colonies and exploited to work in the production of crop rice and tobacco and cotton. You might be thinking, well, why would she bring up slavery? And that's because everything that we're discussing today stem from the beginning of slavery. And so it's very important that we understand why are we faced with these challenges that we per se didn't do, but they've just come along with society and we're always dealing with different challenges. And so this is why. The origins of this started here, and this is where uh, systemic racism started. And so we have to understand that and be able to embrace it and not take it personal because we didn't create the situation, we live in the situation. And we as human service workers, it is our job and our, our understanding to try to make our world a better workplace so we can provide services for those who are less fortunate to provide the necessary uh, resources for themselves. All right, so where do we go next? So from slavery, everybody gets that you understand it. There's a lot of components to it that we don't have time to discuss, but you get the basis of where this all began. Between 1877 and 1954, um, when slavery was after slavery, I guess, I guess I could say, then we had the Jim Crow laws, um, which were state and local laws introduced in Southern states in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that enforced uh, racial, racial segregation, and then the laws remained in effect to 1968. How does this play into effect of what we're going into when we're talking about diversity, when we're talking about equity, when we're even talking about um, inclusion and culturally responsive? This all goes back to some of these things that was taking place um, during those times. Um, we People were being separated um, at those times and what wasn't allowed regardless of your color to come together. So that created uh, an environment or, or a culture where based on the color of your skin, you were not accepted or allowed to go into other places. So that has a lot to do with um, diversity and how this thing about equity comes along into play. So when we talk about uh, diversity, um, I, I looked and I looked and I've been looking and I'm actually working on my PhD um, in human services. And it's really hard to um, define diversity because everybody has their own opinion or it's so many definitions out there. But when, when I look at uh, diversity, I just say it's a presence of difference, different things, different people, different cultures. Um, different ethnic backgrounds. So kind of all those things that you see on this PowerPoint can play into diversity because diversity, it's it's huge and it's broad. Um, and it has a lot to do, it, it could have something in education, but then we have our workplace diversity issues. Then for um, community-based uh, businesses like I have, 
we have diversity issues with getting clients or diversity issues with being able to serve clients based on their um, ethnic background. And so understanding diversity is very important and why it, it is so important that we are, uh, uh, um, excuse me, embrace it. The University of Maryland defines diversity as the representation of multiple groups within a prescribed environment, such as a workplace, differences between cultural, cultural groups, respecting cultural differences by recognizing that no cult culture inherently um, is superior to one another. And so if we can just take that and kind of just step back for a second and look at some of those words and say, am I practicing this? Is this something that I believe in? When we're in this, this kind of business, we have to make sure that we don't have our own um, unconscious bias that might be prohibiting us from practicing diversity. We might think we're practicing or we might think we're doing it, but are we really doing it? Um, because there are things that contribute to the um, hidden biases and, and things like that. So we just have to sometimes step back and really look at it and actually analyze our own selves and say, hey, am I doing the right thing? Am I really understanding what this is about? How can I make sure within my own organization or if I'm the leader of an organization, how can I make sure that my team or my division is following um, the right protocols? We have the, the right mindsets to make sure we're being fair and equal to all um, and we're respecting them no matter what their background might be of. All right, so from diversity, we go over to uh, civil rights moment, movement. The Civil Rights Act of 19, 1964 is a landmark, landmark civil rights and labor law in the United States that outlaws against discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Why is that important? When you look at these dates, even going back to diversity from 1948, we're still, we're in 2023 and we're still, uh, fighting these fights and we're still going through the same challenges. So again, I think it goes back to us as people um, and our mindsets and our willingness to change and our willingness to move on and our willingness to make the world wanna be a, a better place. The civil rights movement um, is, it's very important because it did create some laws that would help some of these situations, but at the same time, some of these practices are low key still taking place. Um, right now, the um, L LGTQ um, Q community, they're really struggling. They're really going through it. Uh, African-Americans, uh, Black people, we're still going through it. Um, Asian-Americans, um, they're facing challenges. So we're still fighting fights from 60, 70 years ago. Um, and again, it goes back to mindset. And I, I, I believe, you know, for in order for these things to change, um, we have to not only just look at local, we have to look at state, we have to look, look at federal and even our constitution because some of the things that's written in our constitution still reflects from the 1800s, which is having an impact on why things are so easily to be changed uh, or rewritten based on we believe. So, and, and that's kind of what's happening in the Supreme Court right now with all these different fights because people is trying to assume what our forefathers uh, was trying to say or wrote to be said. Affirmative action. So affirmative action um, was established around the same time as the uh, diversity. And they actually were kind of hand in hand, except for with the affirmative action, um, it was more about uh, schools and being defined as a set of procedures designed to eliminate unlawful discrimination among applicants, um, remedy the results of such prior discrimination and prevent such discrimination in the future. Applicants may be seeking admission to an educational program or looking for a professional em um, employment. Why is this important? Um, we see as far as colleges, um, the affirmative action law has now changed. So we're kind of going backwards to the 1964 uh, where they fought to get this ruling. And then when you look at uh, me example as a, uh, I would consider myself to be highly educated, but I, when it comes to getting higher up positions or positions where you have a status, 
I have to fight 10 times harder to get that position than my white peers. And it shouldn't be that. It should be based on experience, education, and background. But deep, deep hidden in, and not all organizations, but within some organizations that is still taking place. Um, and those are the kind of things that we want to dismantle to make our world a better place. Talk about women, um, the glass ceiling. So I'm working on a project for school. And as I was reading and I've been reading, I learned about the glass cliff, which I had never heard of. Um, why is this important? So if you're a woman, it doesn't matter what color you are. Um, and again, black women just experience it more, but white women have also experienced it. Um, it's hard for us to move up in the ranks. In this era, we're beginning to move up. But back in the day, it was kind of like that scene and not be heard. So women, we were more the secretaries, go run and get the coffee. Why is this important with um, equity? And, and it's, it's important because we as women, we deserve the same, I guess you could call it platform or playing ground as men. And it shouldn't matter if we're a woman, why we can't excel into some of those same positions. You're just now seeing where you got the CEOs of Ford and Coca-Cola and, and those kind of things. But before um, it was all men, most executives and top executives were men. So experts and advocates for women of color say black women are often hired or promoted to leadership roles in their jobs during times of crisis, which can lead to burnout or failure. So this is moving from the glass ceiling to the glass cliff. And now what they're saying in, uh, is that Black women are being promoted into these positions now, but they're being set up for failure because the position is already to a point where the level of burnout is already there as they're moving into the position because the requirements of the job is so heavy. Um, CNN reports that the phenomenon is known as the glass cliff, which is excuse me, essentially the opposite of the glass ceiling. Research from Utah State University shows Black women are more likely than white men to be appointed to leadership roles in companies that are struggling and put them on the glass cliff. Whoops, sorry. Many, many Black women found themselves at the edge of the glass cliff in recent years due to the effort by companies and public agencies to diver diversify their companies and staff as part of the DEI initiatives that sprang up after resurgence of the Black, Li Black Lives Matter movement. So when you're, you're thinking about this, think if you were an owner of a company and you've, you're getting all this pressure about some of the changes that you need to do for your company to make sure you have X amount of Black women, X amount of Black men, X uh, amount of Hispanics and so on and so forth you're putting these people in these positions to fill the requirements of a law. And what happens in these positions is because it's not done because you're being genuine and you're just doing what the law says you have to do. Normally these things are, they really come crashing and burning because they're not going to be effective because when the action was taking place, it wasn't done with sincere. That's why we haven't begun to see a downfall yet of this DEI initiative because it really, right before COVID and right during COVID, they really started pushing this. And people are gonna start backpedaling on this DEI initiative. And if you, if you watch the news, you'll see in Florida, uh, those things are being cut out. Those things are important, um, especially um, for people of such as myself as a black woman, um, because I already have a struggle just because I'm Black. And so to at least have these in place and we're really trying to work towards making sure that we're doing them and we're doing them intentional, things can change in the workplace and we can really make stride on making these things change and change forever, not just going backwards eventually after a few years. The 20th and the 21st century, I'm sure some of you guys have all seen this. And in t so normally we talk about um, equity, equality. We talk about those things in reality. Well, now we're beginning to take this a, a step uh, further. So if you look to the farthest to the left, you see uh, the reality. And the reality is 
uh, the guy standing on the tall uh, box, he has what he needs. And this is talking about a disparity. So he, he has what he needs times whatever, 10, 20, 30. So what it's telling us, it says one gets more. In reality, one gets more than is needed while others get less than is needed. This is a huge disparity created. That is why we have so many issues in our fields and what we do is because of this reality thing. Then we go to the next box. So this is, this is how society began to change. So um, we get to the equality. And based on the three boxes, it's the assumption that everyone benefits from the same supports. This is considered to be equal treatment. Well, we all know in this field that that does not work either. Everybody's needs are different. Some people may need two boxes. Some people may need three boxes, so on and so forth. So we can't, when they say treat us with equality or treat me equally, that statement is actually so untrue because my needs might be different than your needs. And so everybody's situation needs to be specific and based on their needs um, and their situations. Now we've started getting into, in the third box closest to the right, we've started getting to uh, equity. And equity is basically everyone gets the support they need, which produces equity. Meaning the guy in the, the standing out on the ground, he already had what he needed. So he can come down and now we can begin to put the next person up. And if you go back to reality, that person was all the way down to the ground and in, in uh, Equality, the person in the purple was still on their knees, but they was making a rise. In equity, we're all on the same platform. And if you notice in the picture, everybody is equal, but it's based off their situation and where they're at. Now, in today's society, we're moving over to justice. And that goes back to those previous slides that I was showing you and why it was important to show you that. It's because the laws, the constitution, the rules and the regulations, if they're not catered or fixed to make the system change, the system will never change. So you can see all three can see the game without supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. The systemic barrier has been removed. And that goes back to, again, all of our systems that is in place. Um, no workplace can, tru can truly achieve equity without addressing the widening pay gaps that exist. For every dollar that a white uh, man makes, Black women are paid uh, 58 cents, uh, reports indicate. So just the wealth gap itself is a prime example of this box and why it's so important. So when we think about um, respite care and just say somebody might not qualify for respite care, but then you have a program like this that if they get turned down for this, now you have this. So that is creating equity because even though this one particular system, we know they need it, they just did not meet the qualifications for whatever reason, there is still a program out there that is creating equity um, for the rest of the services to still take place. And if you remember in the beginning of her slide, she was saying just four hours a week, can improve somebody's life. So when we look at that, these are important things um, that we have to take into play when we're talking about equity, when we're talking about diversity, and I would go a step further and say even justice. Here we are just a few years ago, um, and this is kind of where we're at today, um, and we're moving, we're, we're moving out of it, if you notice. So we're going to be going on to something else here pretty soon. So the peak of everything with uh, diversity, equity, culturally responsive, kind of just came flying on us during the Black Lives Matter time when George Floyd. We had other uh, uh, incidents that took place, but none of them took the forefront like George Floyd. So with the Black Lives Matter, uh, this the context of Black Lives Matter is taken out of proportion. So as a Black person, let me just give you my, I can't speak for every Black person, but let me give you what my definition of Black Lives Matter. And it's important because we talk about diversity. For me, it's just saying me as a human, I matter. 
the reason why it says black is because I'm black. And so I'm being specific to my background. Not that to say nobody else, no white people, no Hispanics, no, no other races don't matter. Because we are the rate that has the highest disproportionality, that's why we're saying Black Lives Matter. And again, I can't speak for all Blacks because other people have other intentions behind it. But when I look at Black Lives Matter, it's just saying, please be fair to me. Please give me the same opportunities. Please don't shoot me if my hands is up. Please see me for who I am, not the color of my skin. And that's where we need to come as a world. Look at the person's character, um, not who they are or what their skin speaks for based on past. And so this is kind of where we're stuck at because of history. And we, if we can get beyond this color thing, I think we in the world could be uh, much better. But because we're so stuck on color, it kind of makes everything we do, no matter what job you're in, no matter what you're doing, it kind of gets us stuck. Um, when you think about respite or you think about, um, I do respite for adults and I do respite for kids. So one of my um, issues that I have just as a provider is the fact that sometimes it's hard to get clients or when, when I go do a visit, the clients see that I'm black and then they no longer want my services. That's a hard pill to swallow just because I'm black. You don't know my services. You haven't given me an opportunity as a provider. It's just because of what you were brought up on or what your beliefs is, you you don't want me to serve you. Not in the the fact is, is my organization is very diverse, but you didn't give me that chance. That is very hard in this field as a black business um woman in trying to uh build up a business where it could be successful. Um, of getting referrals just based on my color. Not that it's the organization. So not like it's one of the programs itself. Sometimes you go, you get the clients that says in the background, oh, nothing against them, but I prefer a white person or I, I don't prefer a person of color. I understand it because it's about history. So I don't take it personal. It's just kind of disheartening that you get turned down because of that and not given a fair um, opportunity. Culturally responsive care. What is that? That's being responsive um, is a philosophy that guides human service providers towards fully seeing and value, valuing clients for all aspects of their identity, background, and experiences by helping people feel safe, understood, and accepted um, and cultural comp, um, competence. So that's just understanding one's culture. That's just building a relationship. That's taking the time to get to know. Um, if you look at uh, some of the practices of people from different countries, they might rear their children different than we do. What we might call um, abuse, they may not call that abuse. So we might um, think that they're doing something out of the norm because that's not what we were taught. Uh, me being Black, there are certain things that Black parents say or Black parents do or certain ways we do things. and people will be like, whoa, or I, sometimes I'll have people say to me, hey, Tracy, will you, and I, I know why they're saying it because I'm black. And it's, it's because I can relate to that individual because he or she is black. And it makes a huge difference in the world. Um, it's just like I have a, a, a young lady from the Philippines that is on my team. Excellent. She's excellent. And it's great having her because when you run into a situation where you need a to, for her to uh, take that client, she's able to do it. She's able to speak the language. She's able to make them feel comfortable. Um, I can't do that. So, you know, just as a black woman, I can't speak their language. I don't understand it. I don't know their culture. I'm learning their culture, but having different people on your team that can respond to the needs of different individuals, that is why diversity is so important. Uh, in organization, because when you look at diversity, if you don't have diversity in your organization, there's no way you can do uh, culturally responsive care because you can't meet the needs. You can take care of them, but you can't meet the needs and maybe understand where they're coming from. Um, culturally responsive uh, care 
uh, is continued. So cultural comp um, competence helps address the many barriers uh, to care that prevent marginalized populations from receiving support. Um, I have an uncle, he won't take um, care from a white person. That's just his fear. He has a fear from back in the day, he was born in like 1940, no, 1935, 35, 41, somewhere in there. And he has a phobia. So, and you try to explain it to him and he don't get it. And it's kind of like the opposite of a white person that was born back in their area. They grew up in the time where racism was the norm and that's just who they are as an individual. So you have to be able to look at it from both perspectives um, and then you have to embrace it. And then you have to figure out a way as human service workers and providers, how can we make this better? How can we um, make sure that when we're going into somebody's house, um, we're doing the right thing, we're meeting their needs and then we're respecting their culture. Culture influences people's beliefs and values and how they speak and address, how they speak and dress and other ways of experiencing the world. It can also impact their mental health, including where they seek help, what type of help they seek and who provides emotional support. Again, I know we're running out of time because I can talk, but for black people, you got to drag us to see a, a mental health person. It doesn't matter if it's white, black or orange. Um, we just grew up on, we don't need to see that. We don't have mental health. Uh, there's no such thing. That's just who the person is. Um, so when you, as a white person, it might come into a black home and they say, oh, we're not doing no therapy, da 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 You have to understand that's our culture. That's what we grew up on. It's not that we really don't want it. We're embarrassed. Um, if you talked about mental health, that's an embarrassment. And so until we as Black individuals and Black people can embrace mental health, then we're still going to face those challenges. And so are you as support workers to come in and assist. And those are my references. And that is my presentation. I hope we have a couple of minutes for questions. Tracy, that was incredible. Thank Leslie you. and I were Leslie and I were texting and I just said this is the biggest key takeaway if you don't have diversity in your organization you cannot have culturally responsive care and then Leslie said can we vote her for president <laughs> 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 oh that was yeah definitely I, oh my gosh goosebumps um I just want to read some of the comments. If people have questions, they're more than welcome to chime in. Um, Roxanne said she would like to thank you for the information. Um, Teresa said civil rights movement. Every every woman is struggling today. Um, Sebastian had to go, but thank you for the presentation. Teresa, I've been to a lot of programs similar to this, but never with the history you gave. Really insightful. I know, really. We see like you blew us away at the uh, at the summit, but like the history that this dug into was incredible. Like I cannot thank you for the time you spent on this presentation and the information and history that you gave us. And can you tell us a little bit more about the PhD you're going for? Yeah, so I'm working on my um, PhD in human services because that's where my heart is. Is I love helping people and I love working with people. But my uh, project that I'm, I, I'm in Capella University, um, but my okay. project that I'm working on is going to be focused on diversity and um, equity and inclusion. But then I'm going to take it a step further with justice because I know the laws have an impact to how much we can do as a community uh, and community providers. But I'm, I'm yeah. really excited about it. Um, I look forward to doing a lot of work in the state of Wisconsin and bringing some positive changes, um, not only for the African American community, but for other um, communities and people with disabilities. Oh, gosh, that was just the best. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Um, Teresa said, I would love to hear more about the specific cultural differences as well. Talking with people that are having difficulty accepting help, tips to assist would be helpful. Okay. Well, when we talk about helping people, it's about building relationships. And if you can build a relationship with a person, that person will go to limits for whatever. I had, I had, I have a client right now. Um, and when I first got her, she was like a rockhead. 
Like this, this lady refused to do any and everything. And I've been with her for two years and she's white and I'm black um, and her kids is mixed. Um, but she had trust issues and it wasn't just with me because I'm black. It's with anybody that she works with. So everybody on this team of us, we had to build a relationship. We had to show her that we was worthy of her time because she's been let down so much. In, in the black culture, if you're speaking from a black perspective, we have been let down so much by systems um, and, it, you know, from healthcare, or let's just say um, systemic all over that we don't, it's hard for us to believe when people say they're going to do this or they're going to do that, or we're here for your best interest. You know, we're looking out for you. Some of those words, um, they're not trust building relationships. They're actually hindrance because they'll be like, oh, I've heard that before. When you leave, they'll be like, I heard that before. Or they just wanted this, this, or that. I say the key to success, it doesn't matter if they're Hispanic, Jamaican, Black, white, whatever they may be. We have to build personable relationships with our clients in order for them to believe in us. It's kind of like, you got to show me before I'm going to react. And when you show me that you really, really genuinely care, then you can begin to make strides in whatever you might be trying to tackle. I, I have some hard times, but I normally get a breakthrough. Um, and my team is pretty good at that too, um, where we have some tough kids that we be working with with CLTS and it might take a minute, but we get a breakthrough. So it's just building that relationship and just keep chipping away because a lot of African-Americans want help. It's just a trust factor. And you just got to yeah. keep building that. Even if you don't have a black person to send to them, if by all you can refer out somebody that's yeah. black, yeah. do it. But if you can't keep pounding and keep chipping away at building that relationship and eventually you'll get that breakthrough you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. So it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. Persistence and no, time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Teresa said, awesome advice. Relationship building. Trust is perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Tracy nailed it out of the park once again. And a reminder that um, this information will be posted on our website no later by the end of the week. I'm going to try by the end of the day. Tracy, if you'd be so kind to email me this. Yes. Um, that would be great. And then I'm what I'm I'm gonna write a note to myself. There was um there's an awesome, awesome, awesome TED talk about uh St Stephanie Summersville. She did she talked at a conference, an international conference that we hosted. It was actually in Madison. Um she was um a caregiver going into the home of um she didn't know this at the time, but of, of a Klansman. Um, and of the relationship that she built. She was a black woman. Um, she's incredible. We had dinner with her um, the night before that that she spoke. And um, I'm going to include that on the website, just um, if people would like to also listen to that. It's like a 15 minute TED talk, just um, talking about relationship building. And um, she's incredible. Um, Carrie said the same with natives. They don't trust us white people. And why would they? Can't say that I disagree with you, Carrie. All right, everyone. Thank you for what you do. And we will be in touch. Thanks again, Tracy. Thank you, guys. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.